Ladies and gentlemen, please remain standing for the singing of our national anthem. Brexit means Brexit. My administration has accomplished more than almost any administration in the history of our country. Welcome to Mid-Atlantic, the podcast where we examine the news and the views from one side of the Atlantic from the perspective of the other. At least that's what we do normally. In this episode, we're going to venture further afield. We're going to look at some of the stories, myths, propaganda at the heart of the Israel and Palestine conflict. Uh, This is, of course, set against the current backdrop of Israel's conflict with Hamas. Joining us to delve into these complex events is Professor Benny Morris, an Israeli historian who is renowned for his critical examination examination of the conflict's history. As tensions rise in the Middle East, Professor Morris's insights are even more pertinent than ever. We'll discuss his work on the events of 1948 and their connection to the current conflict, drawing on his comprehensive research into the Palestinian refugee conflict uh, problem and the broader historical context of the region. Professor Benny Morris, how are you today? I'm okay. At least Israel is in the middle of a maelstrom uh, right now. Uh, Just before we kind of delve into um, your work and specifically the set of papers which you did around 1948, some some time ago now, but I think it's really important uh, to look into that uh, because in many ways that is not necessarily the start, but it's one of the most important uh, years for people to understand exactly what's going on. Um, how exactly on a personal level have you been affected by the events of October 7th? Well, thankfully, I wasn't involved personally and nobody really close to me was uh, killed or taken hostage by the Hamas. But um, uh, I was like, I think almost all Israelis were, was completely shocked by what had happened. The failure of intelligence to uh, understand what the Hamas was about to launch and the failure of the army to respond or react to what had happened uh, quickly. And of course, shocked by what the Hamas did during those 10, 15 hours in which they controlled about a dozen villages they'd occupied, invaded, um, murdering babies, um, raping women and killing them uh, and taking hostage. Uh, children, babies, old people into Gaza, 240 in number. Altogether, they killed 1,400 Israelis and um, abducted and taken hostage um, uh, about 240 in one day, which is the most shocking, in fact, thing that had happened to the Jewish people since the Holocaust, basically. I, I, I don't want to get too much into the contemporary politics of the last month, but... Um, with your historical head on, I don't know which other head you'd actually have on, but uh, with uh, th- th- thinking of the, the history of the state state of Israel and the, the shocking failure of intelligence post the kinetic part of this conflict, um, what ramifications do you think there will be for the Israeli security apparatus that it could seem to fail so spectacularly? Well, I think it's fairly clear it's going to be a sort of a repeat of a previous major intelligence failure, and that was 1973 when the Egyptian and Syrian armies surprised the Israeli army um, and attacked uh, Israel in the Sinai Peninsula and the Golan Heights. That was followed by a commission of inquiry and was rapidly followed by um, uh, the forced resignation of the heads of the um, military and uh, effectively also the, the heads of the government within a year. And, and this is going to be, I think, the same, the same thing is going to happen uh, after this. Uh, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu will try to drag out the process as long as possible, um, uh, the commission of investigation as long as possible, which he's also resisting the establishment of. But but um, ultimately, he will have to be forced. He will be forced to resign uh, 
um, uh, the chief of general staff, the head of intelligence, military intelligence, the head of the security service, the Shin Bet, uh, and the head of Southern Command. These all these heads will roll for certain. I mean, there's no no way this can be avoided. And my um, sense is also that the government, Netanyahu's incompetent, corrupt government, um, proven before this failure on October the 7th, will also basically have to go and there will be new elections within a year or two in Israel. This is my uh, assessment of what's coming. And that doesn't depend on how this war is going to end. Uh, the current uh, Israeli um, counteroffensive against the Hamas in Gaza perhaps involving eventually the Hezbollah in uh, Lebanon and maybe even involving Iran itself, uh, which uh, would deserve being hit uh, at long last uh, for all the things it's been doing in the Middle East in the past 20 years. Thank, thank you for that perspective. May, maybe if we have time towards the end of the show, we can come back and maybe um, question you a little bit more about uh, the current conflict, possibly a post-conflict world. But but thank you for that. The rising tension in Palestine that held world attention. Partition had brought a new flare-up in the strife between Arab and Jew. Politically, the conflict appeared to be settled. In actual fact, it had only just begun. The United Nations Special Committee had advocated separate Jewish and Arab states as the uneasy compromise. The plan was accepted by 33 votes to 13. Alexander Kadagan, Britain's representative, abstained. Prince Faisal of Saudi Arabia headed the Arab country's opposition. The Jewish state will include the ports of Haifa and Tel Aviv and the whole of the Negev Valley. The Arab will occupy the fertile eastern part. Jerusalem will come under United Nations trusteeship. First reaction from the Jews was one of joy. Crowds gathered in the streets and greeted the birth of their state with traditional dances. Britain's civic administration is expected to withdraw by May. Jews and Arabs will then govern themselves. Arab opposition to the partition scheme has been violent. The call for a holy war against the Jews went out from Cairo. Um, let's go back to 1948. This is a year which doesn't only create the state of Israel, other the year creates it, but you get my point, that the state of Israel has created that year. But it also kind of creates the current issue of Palestinian, let's say, uh, homelessness, if not statelessness. Uh, and, and you really have focused in on that year um, to call yourself a new historian. So for people who are new to the detail of Israeli history, um, tell us the significance of, of your work in studying 1948 and maybe how it's changed Israeli perceptions of what happened that year. Well, that's a whole lot of things to say, but but um, let, let me put it simply. I'll talk a little about 1948, and then you, we can go on. Um, 1948, I think, is the crucial year in the evolution of the um, Zionist Arab conflict, which uh, today is more or less focused on the Israeli-Palestinian part of the conflict, but it was a more general thing. The Arab world and the Islamic world opposed the um, um, creation of a Jewish state in the land of Israel, which is called Palestine um, uh, by Arabs and much of the world. Um, in 1947, at the end of 1947, the United Nations General Assembly trying to solve the clash between Jews and Arabs in Palestine, which was then ruled by the British, uh, the United Nations General Assembly passed a resolution, Resolution 181, uh, proposing the partition of Palestine into two states, one Jewish, one Arab. This is November 1947. The Jews accepted the partition proposal uh, and plan, and the Arabs, Palestinian Arabs, rejected it, and the Palestinian Ara Arabs were supported by the Arab states around Egypt, Jordan, uh, Syria, uh, Lebanon, Iraq, uh, and they too rejected the proposal. And the day after the resolution passed in uh, New York in the General Assembly, in the um, uh, 29th of November, 1947, the day after that, the Palestinians began shooting, starting the 1948 war. They were defeated by the Israelis uh, by the middle of 1948, the Palestinian militias, the Palestinian people, if you like. Uh, at the time, there were about 1.2 million Palestinians in Palestine, Arabs, and there were 650,000 Jews. 
Nonetheless, the Jews beat the Palestinian militias and the Arab states invaded Palestine on the 15th of May 1948, coming to their brother's aid, eh, aiming in some way to destroy the Jewish state or at least to diminish it eh, substantially or hurt it substantially. The Arab states were also defeated in that war. And by 1949, there was an armistice between the Israelis and the, the Arab states around and the Palestinians who had been defeated in, in, in many of them fled the area which became the state of Israel. Some were expelled. Some were asked by their leaders to leave. Many of them just fled the battle, probably hoping that after the war, they would come back under uh, the aegis of the Arab armies or the United Nations or God knows how, that they would come back to their homes. But in the end, they didn't. And what, one of the two results of the 48 war was the, the defeat of the Arab states, of course, and the Palestinians, but also the creation of the state of Israel and the creation of a vast Palestinian refugee problem. Of the 1.2 million Palestinians, 750,000 or 700,000 approximately were displaced from their homes from the area which became the state of Israel. Most of them went to the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, which is today the place where battle is has been joined again. Um, and others fled to Jordan, Syria, and Lebanon. But most of them fled to the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. One last point. Um, in 1947, the Gaza Strip, that is Gaza City, Dir al-Balakh, Rafiyah, and so on, contained something like 60,000 Arabs, uh, uh, inhabitants. Um, by the end of 48, uh, with the refugees who poured into it, the place had 260,000 population. In other words, uh, four-fifths of the population were refugees by the end of 1948. Refugees who come from outside the Gaza Strip and uh, had been settled there in camps or whatever. Um, uh, and what we see today is basically a clash of the descendants of those 200,000 refugees, who now number something like 2 million, um, and the Israeli army. So that's what happened in terms of the Gaza Strip, which was occupied in 1948 by the Egyptian army, but was lost to Egypt in 1967 when Israel won the Six-Day War and took the Gaza Strip and the Sinai Peninsula, and also occupied the West Bank and East Jerusalem, where again, most of the Palestinians uh, uh, lived basically, 1967. Why... It was your um, research into uh, the expulsion or what the Palestinians would call the Nakba um, so controversial um, all those years ago? Why were you seen as somewhat of a re re revision? Re I'm going to say that again for the sake of the edit. Why were you seen as a revisionist? Well, until the 1980s, the Zionist narrative, the Israeli narrative, was that the Palestinians who had become refugees, those 700,000, uh, were essentially uh, ordered by their leaders or advised by their leaders or by the Arab states' leaders to leave their homes, to make way for the Arab invading armies and that they would come back on the back of uh, victorious Arab armies. Um, that was the Israeli narrative. Um, uh, the Palestinian narrative was that the Israelis, with predetermination and pre-planning, had expelled these 700,000 people in line with what they saw as Zionist ideology. Uh, my, my research in the 1980s on the newly opened Israeli documentation, but also newly opened American, British, and United Nations documentation, showed that the truth lay somewhere in the middle. In other words, subverting the Zionist narrative, but in some ways subverting also the Arab narrative. There was no predetermined plan. Uh, there was no uh, systematic expulsion of the Palestinians. But on the other hand, most of them fled because of Israeli conquest and fear of Israeli conquest, uh, Israeli atrocities in the 48 war. Um, uh, it wasn't because their leaders called them, though some, a certain percentage did leave because of advice or orders by their leaders. And a certain amount were expelled by Israeli troops deliberately. Most simply fled, probably hoping to come back when uh, the dust settled, but they didn't, and Israel didn't allow them to come back. So this, this sort of conclusion uh, uh, of, of what I found in the documentation, and it was um, uh, in, uh, embodied in two or three books about what had happened in 1948, uh, as I say, um, uh, riled Israelis and was also not really 
um, uh, may, may, didn't really make the Palestinians happen, happy either because it subverted their narrative as well. So, so just to um, put... Well, let, let me add, let, let me, can I add one more thing to this? Okay. The subversion of the Israeli narrative in some way seemed to impun the Israelis and uh, subvert their sense of purity and morality or the mor- morality of their war making in 48. Um, and, and in this sense, the Israelis were very uncomfortable with my findings. Got it. Now, just for just so we kind of um, give flesh to uh, to the expulsions for the listeners, can you give us an example of, let's say, an Israeli inspired uh, atrocity, but then also uh, another example of Palestinians uh, fleeing from, let's say, uh, an encroaching is- Israeli army, because I think that's the, the really important thing that, that what you've said that this wasn't necessarily a systematic thing from Ben Gurion and the uh, and the uh, the government of the time, the newly minted government of the time. But uh, it'd be really good if there's a couple of examples in terms of villages or towns which actually do have an expulsion. So yeah, why don't you t- tell us that? Okay. Um, let me add some uh, a footnote to what I just said or an addendum. Um, there were atrocities on both sides in the 48 war, but it ended up that the Jews committed more atrocities than the Arabs. And this was, as I say, a factor in the um, 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 departure, if you like, or creation of the refugee problem. It, uh, two possible examples of um, uh, what happened in the war um, um, on the 21st and 22nd of April, 1948, the Jewish militia, the main Jewish militia, the Haganah, it took over, conquered uh, parts of um, the, the Arab neighborhoods of the city of Haifa. And um, this conquest basically led to the flight of the majority of Haifa's population. They boarded boats and they fled uh, to Acre and to Lebanon. Some of them walked out, but, but basically um, they fled the town under the impact of the Israeli conquest. In fact, the mayor of Haifa, this was unusual, asked the Jewish mayor of Haifa, asked the Palestinian Arabs to stay in town because they'd been sort of a good coexistence between the two populations in the town. It was about 70,000 Jews, 70,000 Arabs in that town at that time, 1948. And they had coexisted quite well. And the mayor asked them, Shabtai Levi asked them to stay but the Arab leaders of the, the community, the, Pal- the Haifa, Haifa Arab community, said no, and as I say, they fled. So this was an example of flight, basically, of the Arabs under the impact of conquest by the Jews, a fear of the Jews, fear of atrocity by the Jews, um, and perhaps a little bit of nudging by Arab leaders who pushed them to leave, because had they stayed, they might have been blamed as traitors for accepting Jewish sovereignty, accepting Jewish rule, agreeing to live under the Jews. So this was Professor, one one example. Um, Professor, just so we're really clear, so Haifa, in terms of the 1947 UN partition, would have been part of um, Arab Palestine. Just no, so just clear. Haifa, Haifa was deep in the Jewish sector of Palestine, the area of Palestine where there was a Jewish majority. So Haifa Arabs, this was probably one of the reasons they departed so readily, was that they knew that the world had given Haifa to the Jews as part of their state and didn't look forward probably to life under the Jews. The port of Haifa in Palestine lies shattered by bombs and strewn with dead. Victorious Haganah troops have driven the Arabs out of the beleaguered city, taking many prisoners. A few pitiful refugees rescue what few belongings they can. There's a rush for the boats as the bitter strife continues in the stricken Holy Land. Uh, the, another example, and this is from the other end of the scale, if you like, um, is uh, what happened in um, uh, Lida, the town of Lida, which is about 10, 15 miles from Tel Aviv, in the center of the country, next to what's today Israel's main international airport, Ben Gurion Airport. The town of Lida was a, an Arab town. It had something like 25,000 um, population. Um, it was conquered by Israeli troops, or at least oc- the center of the town was occupied by Israeli troops on the 11th of July, 1948. Um, the Arabs 
hadn't formally surrendered, but the center of town was occupied. The morning of the next day, the 12th of July, um, uh, several Arab um, armored cars from the uh, Arab uh, Legion, which is Jordan's army, entered the town, not knowing apparently that the town had been occupied. A firefight developed between the armored cars, the Jordanian armored cars, and the Israeli troops who occupied the center of town. The Israeli uh, battalion, which was in, in the center of town, numbered about four or 500 troops. And there they were, stuck in the middle of town, surrounded by about 20,000 Arabs who hadn't even surrendered. When the ar- armored cars entered town and a firefight began between the occupying force and the Jordanian legionnaires, uh, many of the Arab um, uh, townspeople pulled guns out of their um, um, uh, closets or whatever, and started um, sniping at the Jewish forces. And the Jewish forces put down what they later called this rebellion by the townspeople um, uh, viciously. Israel and uh, Israeli troops apparently killed about 200 Arabs uh, in the town and then immediately issued uh, an order um, for the Arab uh, inhabitants of Lida to leave the town. And um, with a loudspeaker, the Jewish troops moved about town in jeeps and said, you have an hour to go, go eastward towards the Arab Legion lines in the West Bank. And the 25,000 inhabitants of the town uh, left the town. And this was essentially an expulsion. (coughs) And at the same time, Israel ordered the departure as well of the inhabitants of a neighboring Arab town called Ramleh. And these two left. And this was the biggest expulsion of the war. But as I said, this was pretty unusual. Most of the 700,000 fled simply as a result of encroaching battle, the flail of war. They didn't want to get caught up in it, and they simply fled, not because they were ordered by Arab leaders and not because they were told to leave by Jewish um, uh, commanders, but because they were, were in fear and probably expected to be allowed to come back. But Israel, in the middle of the war, said no coming back. You've now left. There will be no mass return of Arabs. Mm. But is it also fairly safe to say that local commanders on the ground uh, sometimes uh, expelled the the Arabs because it was much more beneficial because of the, the fog of war? This was a case of let's get these people out of this place because it's better that we occupy this town and we believe that we will, we, and then, because then we can trust the loyalty of the inhabitants of this town, village, or settlement. Well, yes, the, na- the natural desire of local commanders, say they moved in and conquered a village or conquered a town, the Israeli commanders um, would naturally want not to leave a large Arab population behind, which might start sniping at their um, communications or uh, occupying troops and so on. But the truth is that in most places, People simply fled because before the Israeli troops arrived in the town or village. So there wasn't even a necessity to expel them. Most commanders didn't face this choice of expelling or not expelling because the Arabs left. From that point on, the Israeli occupying troops simply didn't allow Arabs to return to the village. Mm. Uh, considering the... Considering, you know, there's going to be a war in, in 67, there's going to be a war in 73, there's going to be two intifadas, etc. What were, can we contextualize the level of atrocities on both sides? A casual reading of this is that, yes, they happened. But considering the post history, can we say that the level of atrocities was uh, relatively small, or um, is this also part of the narrative that this has been, let's say, underplayed on the Israeli part and maybe exaggerated on the Palestinian? That's a good point you're making. Um, my um, um, research uh, found uh, several dozen um, uh, small massacres, even one or two larger massacres by the Israeli side a certain number of massacres or mass killings of civilians by Arabs. Uh, but altogether, um, my, by my assessment, um, something like 1,000 civilians or POWs, um, uh, Arabs, were killed by Israeli troops in the course of this year-long war. And probably something like 
between two and 300 Israelis, Jews, were killed by Arabs in the course of the war outside of the fighting. I mean, people who were being captured or just deliberate shooting of uh, civilians. Uh, and these numbers are extremely small when you compare atrocities in other wars to what happened in 1948 in Israel-Palestine. Uh, say, for example, in the Yugoslav wars of the 1990s, in a place called Srebrenica, Serbs killed 7,000 um, Muslims, executed them basically, 7,000 in a two or three day uh, spree of killing. Um, I'm talking here, and that's in one or two or three days. Here I'm talking about a year-long war fought between two peoples. The Jews um, uh, essentially attacked by the Arabs, not essentially. They were the, the victims in this war. They were the, the people who were defenders, and the Arabs were the aggressors. In this year-long war, um, actually not that many people died in atrocities. Maybe partly because a lot of people fled. The Arabs didn't manage to conquer Jewish villages or towns almost completely. The Jews conquered 400 or 500 Arab villages and towns, but almost nobody was there when the Jews occupied the place. So atrocities didn't occur in the, the overwhelming uh, number of places. But this was important for the narrative of the new Israeli state to say that we didn't force anybody to go uh P people left and, and what your research says is that it that isn't quite the truth it's, it's a muddled picture sometimes people did get up and go because they were scared but there were some some false expulsions but generally what there wasn't were a level of atrocity so got that point um one of the i, I remember I, in, incidentally let me add to let me add to that i i i distinguish between atrocities and expulsions um, atrocities being killing, deliberate killing of POWs or of civilians, rape of POWs or civilians. Um, uh, as I say, these uh, were very minor uh, in terms of numbers. Everybody killed, of course, is an atrocity and very unfortunate, tragic, but uh, very few occurred. Uh, expulsions here and there occurred, but expulsions were a sort of military necessity because otherwise, if you left population behind you, uh, they, and this, this is a population which uh, had just started a war with you and was trying to kill you. If you left them behind, your war making would suffer um, uh, tremendously as a result. So um, I, I don't call that an atrocity. Um, and um, um, as far as I know, the laws of war also uh, accept that not as an atrocity. No, I, I, absolutely. And I, I was making that uh, distinction, but thank you for, for clarifying that um, there was a population let's say there were population movements whether we want to call that um ethnic cleansing in the modern parlance it wasn't called it then uh, but generally speaking uh, the uh, the level of killing civilians was incredibly low but what did happen was that some sometimes some arab uh, villages the population moved because they were scared that there might be some level of reprisal, and then sometimes that they were forced to move. And it was important for the new Israeli state to underplay the level of, um, let's say, military uh, coercion for some populations to move. But it was important on the Palestinian side to exaggerate that and whatever. So um, that so it and it plays into the um, the the narrative of the Palestinian uh, refugees, we were all turfed out of our homes and it plays into the narrative of the new Israeli state that we were attacked by the this coalition of Arab countries uh, and the population, the, which wasn't Jewish, that might have been here beforehand, the majority of them uh, got up and, and left. So understand that. Um, one of the things which... As a small boy, I, I I was enthralled by the story of the Six Days War in, in 1967 and tanks and Musha Dayan. And it was literally, a uh, Professor, one of the first books I got from Perry Bar Library in Birmingham in England. My mother used to give me uh, my money to go onto the bus, uh, to go to the library, to go to the library, get some books. I got a book about the history of Austria and 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 the, and, and the Six Days War. N never never forgotten how enthralled I was to um, Israeli Israel's military victory there. 
But the narrative of that book was also that in 1948, there had been a miracle in terms of the Israeli uh, success there. One of the things which you also have revised um, is that, isn't it? Uh, saying that the balance of power um, wasn't necessarily in favor of the Arabs. Uh, historians like you, um, you know, new historians, the, the, the term that you phrased, have said that that wasn't necessarily the case and that Israel did have an advantage in manpower and also in arms. Now, you've given us the, the demographics that there were uh, more Palestinian Arabs than there were Israeli Jews. So so why that revision? Why did Israel actually have an advantage in manpower and arms? Well, the manpower disadvantage or disadvantage is even greater, actually. When you consider that there, there were two Arabs for every Jew in Palestine, there were also 10 times more Arabs around Palestine, Jordanians, Egyptians, Moroccans, Iraqis, Syrians. So the Arabs had a tremendous geographical, economic, and a demographic advantage over the 650,000 Jews who lived in Palestine. You have to remember that. It's a very, very small community. But the Jews none, nonetheless won, and it wasn't a matter of miracle. It was basically a matter of organization. The 650,000 Jews had organized properly for war because they knew that the Arabs would attack them. This is what the, the Arabs kept saying. We don't... We can't stand you being here. We will destroy you. We don't want you here. And eventually we will attack you. This was the message the Jews got. And so they organized for war. Later historians would say the Jews didn't organize sufficiently, but they obviously organized enough to beat the Palestinians and then to smash eventually the Arab armies. Even though the smashing of the Arab armies, incidentally, wasn't that total. The Jordanians won almost every battle they fought against the Jews. And so did the Syrians. Um, but uh, the Egyptian army was totally defeated. And at the end of the war, the Jews ended up uh, with a state, which is what, what the Arab states more or less wanted to um, a, a, a halt. That is, they didn't want the Jewish state to emerge. Uh, and the Jews ended up with 2,000 square miles more uh, than the United Nations had allotted them in the partition plan. So the Jews essentially won the war, even though they didn't win all the battles. Um, in addition to this um, a, a prob a business of organization, the Jews had great, much greater motivation than the Arabs um, a, around them and the Arabs am amid them, that is, the, the amidst them, the, the Palestinians, in the battle. And they fought better. They were braver, if you like. Why were they braver? Why did they fight better? Because three years before the Holocaust had ended, the Jew Jewish people, uh, including the relatives of all those 650,000 in Palestine, had just been slaughtered, their brothers, their sisters, their mothers, their fathers. And come the war three years after 1945, three years after the Holocaust, the Jews in Palestine feared a second Holocaust by the Arabs because the Arabs uh, were uh, described as bloodthirsty, um, uh, that they would massacre the Jews if they won the war. So the Jews had great motivation to fight well. And this is what they did with great sacrifice and courage, and they fought much better. Um, uh, the Arab armies also, it should be noted, from Jordan, especially those from uh, Egypt, Syria, and Iraq, were soldiers who came from far, far away. They weren't fighting for their homes or their countries. They were invading another country a long way from their homes. So they had much less motivation. It's true they were motivated also by Islamic ideology, which saw the Jews as an enemy, an infidel who should be uprooted. But essentially, they weren't fighting for their homes and their own lives and their families. So this, this was also important. One other aspect which should be noted is the financial aspect. To fight a war, you need money to buy arms, to buy ammunition, to pro provide for the fuel, for the tanks and the, the, the trucks and whatever. The Jews had the backing economically of world Jewry. They received somewhere between 100 and 150 million dollars in the course of the war from the Jewish people, essentially from American Jewry. Um, and this is what financed their war and financed their acquisition of arms, ammunition, and so on. Whereas the Arab states were essentially poor, especially the frontline states, those who were busy fighting Israel, uh, 
the Egyptians, the Jordanians, the Syrians, these were poor states. And the wealthier Arab states weren't that wealthy. They weren't like today, um, the Saudis and the uh, whatever, who had um, uh, at least some money from um, uh, petrol. Um, um, they, they didn't contribute much to the war. So the Arabs essentially were poor countries fighting a far wealthier country, even though this was a very small country and demographically very small. Perfectly uh, laid out. I just want to come on to another two bits of revisionism, which um, your work on 1948 kind of laid out. That um, the official view was that the Arabs had a coordinated plan and you say that the Arabs were very much divided. You know, the Jordanians had their own goals, the Egyptians had theirs, the Syrians, etc. And then if you could combine your answer with also another official version, which was that there was an Arab intransigence. It was this Arab intransigence that prevented peace. Um, you said initially in that work, and I know some of your views have been somewhat revised, and I'll maybe come on to that later, that... Um, initially, at least what you said was that um, Israel was primarily to blame for the dead end in terms of a, a true solution. So c- could you walk us through those two things? Um, the, okay, I, the Arab- go, on, go on, Professor. I, I, ne- I never said that the, the Israelis were to blame for the lack of a peace settlement at the end of the war. I didn't put it like that. Um, uh, but let's start earlier. The Arab states invaded, uh, that is Syria, Egypt, Jordan, and Syria, invaded Palestine on the 15th of May. The Palestinian Arab militias had been defeated. The Palestinian people had defeated. Many of them had gone into exile, uh, been uprooted from their homes, and the Arab states invaded. It's true that the Arab states invaded for a variety of reasons. Most of the Arab invaders, most of the heads of the Arab states probably um, wanted to help their Palestinian brothers and to crush the Jewish state, or at least to harm it um, uh, critically uh, in their invasion. Um, I'm talking about Syria, Egypt, and the Iraqis. The Jordanians, however, were a sort of a worm in the apple in terms of the Arab alliance, because Jordan's king, Abdallah, had previously, before the war, entered into secret negotiations with the Jews in Palestine to reach a two-state settlement, but not with the Palestinians, a two-state partition of the land between Jordan and the Jews. He wanted Jordan to have the West Bank and East Jerusalem, and the Jews would have more or less the rest. This was the um, sort of deal worked out between Jordan and um, uh, the Jewish agency, which was the Jewish government at the time, before statehood in Palestine. Um, uh, And this was sort of a semi not a written agreement, but more or less uh, agreed by the two sides. Uh, This meant that the Palestinians would not have a state and that the UN partition resolution would leave the Jews part of Palestine and the Jordanians would take over the rest. Um, It's true that in the end, the Jordanians and the Jews ended up fighting because they didn't agree about the future of Jerusalem. So there were battles around Jerusalem, on the road to Jerusalem, and so on. But essentially, they partitioned Palestine between them. They took the West Bank and East Jerusalem, the Jordanians, which they managed to hold on to until 1967, when during the Six-Day War, Israel took it over. And the Jews held, at the end of the 1948 war, the rest of the uh, territory of uh, um, historic Palestine, except for the Gaza Strip, which, as I said, was occupied by the Egyptians. The Egyptians and the Syrians uh, um, and the Jordanians also had, um, apart from this general wish to not have a Jewish state as their neighbors, that is the Syrians, the the Egyptians, and the Iraqis, um, they they had also particularist um, intentions. That is, the Egyptians wanted to occupy the southern part of Palestine, the Negev. The the Syrians apparently wanted to take over the Sea of Galilee and part of the Galilee, and so on. So each of them entered with also particularist um, annexationist desires, if you like, imperialist desires, in addition to destroying the Jewish state. And as I said, the Jordanians wanted the West Bank, but also were willing to leave the Jews, uh, the rest of Palestine, for their state. So this this disunity among the Arab invaders of, of Palestine on the 15th of May, eventually, even though they all invaded on the same day, 
um, this the unity fell apart because of this disunity, and eventually they each went their own ways. And the Jordanians sort of left the war in July 1948, left the war making to the Egyptians and the Syrians, and the Syrians dropped out a few months later, leaving Israel opposite the Egyptians at the end of the war. And Israel defeated the Egyptians, and then the Egyptians sued for peace by the end of 1948, and this led to the armistice agreement, which formally ended the war. So this was important. Um, in terms of the war making, and that also a reason why Israel won the war because of disunity between the various uh, Arab armies' commanders. At the end of the war, Israel and the Jordanians renewed their peace peace uh, negotiations, their secret peace negotiations, but they couldn't agree on um, terms for a separate Jordanian-Israeli peace. Uh, Abdallah had a cabinet which was averse to a separate deal with the Jews. Um, they basically, m- much of the cabinet, were worried they would be accused uh, as traitors if they broke Arab ranks and made peace separately with the Jews, much as Sadat did the same thing and made peace with Israel in 1979 and paid with it with his life uh, a couple of years later by a Muslim assassin. Uh, the same thing, incidentally, happened to Abdullah, who had made these secret negotiations but never actually signed a peace agreement with Israel, but was nonetheless assassinated by a Palestinian gunman in 1951. So uh, Arab leaders have learned that if you start making peace with the Jews, uh, you're going to be assassinated. This has always been something on Arab leaders' minds when they approach the idea of making peace with the Jews. But in any case, the Jordanians and Israelis failed to reach agreement. It's possible the Israelis, and I may have suggested this in uh, various books, the Israelis could have been more generous in the peace terms Israel offered in exchange for peace with the Jordanians, a, a perhaps some form of re- refugee repatriation, a, perhaps a little territory here and there, and the Jews said, "No, you guys attacked us. A, we don't want to. We don't want to pay for peace. Um, a, you don't deserve it. Um, certainly, you don't deserve lar- large chunks of uh, concessions." A, and no, no peace deal was made. So I say it was partly Israel's fault, partly internal Jordanian politics. The other Arab states were unwilling to make peace with Israel. Uh, On this, I may have slightly revised my my, uh, views in the sense that Israel wasn't, as I say, generous about um, a possible repatriation of refugees in exchange for Arab willingness to make peace. Um, But on the other hand, the Arab leaders in Syria, in Iraq, in uh, Egypt were unwilling to make real peace with the Jews. This essentially is, is the truth of the situation at the end of the 48 war. The Arab leaders had been terribly humiliated by their defeat by this cluster of 650,000 Jews um, uh, and weren't going to be further humiliated by um, agreeing to peace with the 650,000 Jews. Um, So I think that was probably the main reason Arab states were unwilling simply to accept this Jewish state in their midst. And one mustn't forget the Jewish state in their midst was literally that. It cut the Arab world in two. Israel slices the Arab and two uh, Arab world and the Muslim world today also, but then as well at the end of the forty eight war in two. On the left, you've got um, the Arab states of North Africa, Egypt, Morocco, and so on. On the right, you have Egypt, uh, Iraq, uh, Syria, and Jordan. And this uh, again was a terrible humiliation for the Arabs that their world had been cut in two by the establishment of this Jewish state. The United Nations General Assembly, which helped create the State of Israel, now votes on the Young Republic's application for UN membership. Assembly President Everett announces... And I therefore formally declare Israel admitted to membership in the United Nations. America's Austin congratulates Foreign Minister Moshe Shalit as Israel's delegation joins the General Assembly. Next day at Lake Success, the Blue and White Star of David joins the flags of the other 58 member states. Israel, born of war, takes... In Tel Aviv, the crowds are so big that a giant parade has to be canceled. In synagogues throughout the nation, worshippers recite from the psalms of praise, Enough have you sat in the veil of weeping. And they translate their words into rejoicing action. In Jerusalem, the parades take place as scheduled. So essentially, I think the Arab leaders were unwilling to make peace at the time with the Jews. Um, the uh, Egyptians in 90, after the 1973 war 
came to understand that it's probably better, at least Sadat, the president of Egypt, came to understand that it's better to reach a peace agreement with Israel rather than continuing this endless war with the Jews, which might end up in, in the destruction of Egypt uh, in a nuclear war, which is a possibility Sadat, I think, feared. And um, that led Sadat to break ranks with the Arabs in the 1970s and make peace with the Jews. Um, uh, and Ar- other Arab states like Jordan followed making peace with Israel in the 1990s. And recently, we see the United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, Morocco, etc., making peace with the Jewish state or normalizing relations with the Jewish state. Um, all of this sort of took a long time for the Arab world to accept the existence of a Jewish state in their midst, but eventually much of the Arab world agreed to it. The problem, of course, remains that the Palestinian problem at the core of this conflict remains unresolved and is a real um, thorn in the side of anybody who wants to make peace between the Jews and the Arabs in the Middle East. I want to end up talk, talking about that because it seems to be that the, one of the goals of the Israeli state is to isolate the, the Palestinian people by having the peace treaties with Jordan or Morocco, Egypt, uh, of which, which you've said. But just before we, we finish up with, with 1948 specifically and your work um which is well, ostensibly when you looked into Israeli government papers, that how can you reconcile? Was it easy to reconcile the fact that you're a Zionist and to have the pushback, at least the initial pu- pushback that you had in terms of the rewriting of the the mythology, uh, the, the the propaganda of the early Israeli state? I want to end up talk talking about that because it seems to be that the, one of the goals of the Israeli state is to isolate the, the Palestinian people by having the peace treaties with Jordan or Morocco, Egypt, uh, of, of which, which you've said. But just before we, we finish up w- w- with, with 1948 specifically and your work, um, which is well, ostensibly when you looked into Israeli government papers, that how can you reconcile? Was it easy to reconcile the fact that you're a Zionist and to have the pushback, at least the initial pu- pushback that you had in terms of the rewriting of the the mythology, uh, the, the the propaganda of the early Israeli state? I, I don't think I had a real problem. Um... The truth is I grew up in Israel and in New York. That is, uh, my father was a diplomat, so some of my youth and childhood was spent abroad. Um, I didn't uh, undergo a normal Israeli education, primary school, high school. Uh, I did later do a a, a BA in the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, but then I did a PhD on European history, in fact, in Cambridge, so I had a sort of an external perspective on what went on here. But also I was an Israeli, so I knew this Israeli society and the way it operated and worked from within. Um, so in that sense, I think I sort of had a more objective perspective. Um, I my, my sense was reading through the documentation, but knowing the narratives of both sides, that um, um, the Zionist cause was a just cause. The Jews deserved a state, should have established a state, and were right in establishing a state. Um, and the Arabs essentially were wrong in not allowing the establishment of it or not wanting to allow the establishment of the Jewish state. Um, the Arabs have today 23 or 24 states, whatever the number is, from the Atlantic to the Persian Gulf. The Jews have this little strip of land called Israel, one state, so I think there's a sort of a fairness in this division of the territory between the Atlantic and the Persian Gulf. Um, but uh, looking at the documentation, I found uh, in the 1980s when I began my research that um, some of the things the Jews decided and some of the things the Jews did on their march to statehood and in the 48 war and in the 1950s weren't completely moral or were. Um, darkened by um, uh, certain um, uh, incidents and events and things they did which weren't um, uh, didn't leave a pure, a pure picture of the Zionist enterprise. 
Um, and as I say, this in a sense clashed with my view that Israel basically was right in the things that it had done in the sense of establishing a state and wanting to maintain a state for the Jews as a refuge, if you like, uh, from a world which had oppressed Jews for 2,000 years and so on. Um, um, and that the Arabs were wrong in the sense that they were unwilling to compromise. The truth is that the Arabs have come around, many of the Arabs, not the Palestinians necessarily, but they've come around to accepting the existence of a Jewish state in this little sliver of territory called Palestine or the land of Israel. Let, let, me, let me add one more thing. My function, my job or my vocation, or whatever you want to call it, as an historian meant that I should look at the documents, as many documents as I could get. And incidentally, Arab archives are all closed. Arab states, all of them being dictatorships, they don't open their archives. But there's sufficient documentation in the Israeli archives, the British archives, the American archives to work out what had happened in 48. And my job as an historian was to look at the documents and see what they told me told happened. And this is what I wrote down to the annoyance of many Israelis and to the annoyance of some Palestinians. But this is what historians are supposed to do. Is it in 2023, after the Hamas attack, is it still easy to describe yourself as a Zionist and and to believe in a solution, a political, a geopolitical solution, which would have as its end game a Palestinian state, which is viable? I, as a Zionist, I'm agreeable to a two-state solution. I think that's a solution which would give a modicum of justice to both peoples. The Jews would have a state and the Arabs would have, a, Palestinian Arabs would have a small state consisting essentially of the West Bank, the Gaza Strip, East Jerusalem, and perhaps in confederation with Jordan, which would be a fairly sizable state, at least two or three times the size of Israel if it confederated with Jordan. This would be the ideal. The problem is um, the leadership in Jordan doesn't want this. They don't want to um, um, subordinate themselves to Palestinians and become part of a Palestinian state. And many Jews here don't want a, a, a two-state solution. They want all of Palestine or the land of Israel for themselves. And the Palestinians have never given up the idea of destroying the Jewish state and converting all of Palestine into an Arab-Palestinian state. This is the problem. So I may want a two-state solution, a Jewish state side by side with a Palestinian Arab state, perhaps, as I say, confederated with Jordan. But most people here in this area today aren't agreeable to this. Um, and how you get change their minds, uh, I don't know. Look, after World War II, um, as a result of what happened to them in World War II, the Germans and the Japanese changed their minds and became different people. They became Democrats. Uh, they were agreeable to um, uh, concessions, enormous concessions, um, and uh, uh, agreed to live in a peaceful, free world with the Western powers who had beaten them. Uh, the Palestinians um, uh, and many other people in the Arab world have never agreed to the Jews beating them, never have uh, resigned themselves to this. Um, and uh, as far as one can see, they're not yet agreeable to this. And the Hamas attack of the 7th of October um, uh, a few weeks ago only drove home the message that there are a lot of Arabs out there who simply want to kill Jews and get rid of the Jewish state. And, and this is part of the problem, or major part of the problem, also from the Zionist perspective, from the Israeli perspective. Because if this is what the enemy wants, well, it's not going to it's not going to be easy to make peace with them. But it isn't all of what you, your opponents want, though, is it? And, and you and you have kind of hinted at this. You know, there is a difference between Hamas and and, and Fatah, and Fatah finds itself in this almost like an invidious position where. Um, uh, in, in some part, it's seen as collaborating with the Israeli state, but then increasingly, if we deal with the, just the West Bank, that there are Israeli settlers who do want uh, an Israeli state to encompass all of the West Bank, or let's say, call it Judea and Samaria. Um, and these settlements are increasingly encroaching 
on their land and they're powerless to stop it because they are the Palestinian Authority, whereby there are, um, in effect, occupying forces of the state of Israel on two thirds of, of the West Bank. So it's not that all Palestinians um, want to drive Israel off the map. And, and the PLO, which fundamentally is Fatah and, and is the governance of the Palestinian Authority in 1994, uh, gave formal recognition to the state of Israel. Yeah, look, I'm sure there are Palestinians who are willing to make peace with Israel. But I have a feeling that all Palestinians or 95% of Palestinians do not agree to the legitimacy of the Zionist enterprise or the state of Israel. In other words, they may, for real politic reasons, be willing to make their peace with the Jewish state, but in their hearts, they believe Israel and Zionism are a robber state, a robber ideology, which has deprived them of the large part of Palestine. I think this is truthful. I think this is a truthful assessment. The Hamas says so openly that the Jews are robbers and killers, and we must drive them into the sea. The Fatah, or the PLO, as you call them, or the Palestinian Authority, which governs much of the West Bank, um, they say they are willing to um, uh, countenance a two-state solution. I'm not sure how true, how deeply felt this is. But there are, as I say, as you say, Palestinians who are willing to make peace. And there are certainly a lot of Arabs out there, certainly the leadership class in the Arab world, perhaps not the street, but the leadership a class in the Arab world who believes this endless war with the Jews is not going to be good in the end for the Arabs as well, and they must resign themselves to the existence of a Jewish state, as I say, in a very, very narrow strip of the Middle East. I, I think you make a, a really um, interesting point about the real policy and then what's in, in people's hearts. And I, and I would say that um, Egypt in the 1970s after the Yom Kippur War, Sadat, um, needed that Yom Kippur War, um, if you take a wider view of history, to show that he was an Arab nationalist. However, that then gave him somewhat cover to then have peace with relative honour. Um, so what was ever in his heart, the real politique was, as you said, Israel by the 1970s was a, a nuclear state and there was going to be no military defeating of uh, of of Israel by, by Egypt. So whatever was in his heart, this was a case of let's normalize and settle this border with, with, with this nation, regardless of what you, what you think about it, um, in your heart. The real politique is you cannot win this war with four, at least three, if not four kinetic wars, if you count Suez. And each time, uh, we've lost and then maybe the Yom Kippur war, we did our best showing. So, I think the real politique is that, uh, and, and that's the most important thing, that the Palestinian people have had 70 plus years of statelessness. And I don't think any pa- any uh, rational and moderate Palestinian is truly believing that Israel uh, can be defeated, but what they want is a viable state. But Professor, um, I've loved this conversation. We've been talking for an hour. It's been a wonderful to meet you can we maybe get you on the podcast again maybe to talk about um other important um stepping stones from the creation of the state of israel to to where we are now would could, could we call upon you maybe in, a, in another month or so uh, to give us another historical background from an israeli perspective I, i'll be fine with that and incidentally i enjoyed our conversation also in the I'm surprised how knowledgeable you are about my affairs. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I will. I, I will hold my hand up here, Professor. I am, as, as I kind of alluded to. Uh, number one, I'm a total history bore. Okay. And, and as a child, and as a child, as I said, Musha Dayan was one of the most captivating figures for eight, nine-year-old me who was an only <laughs> child and, and and as many boys of that age are they are captivated by military stories of military daring and mil- military do and there is, there was something very evocative uh, to me back then about uh, a people who after 2000 years and 100 generations uh, their descendants have gone back to the land 
which their forefathers used to occupy. And as I say to people over and over, as a history bore, this is unprecedented in human history. To, to, to redraw the world's map back to something 2,000 years ago doesn't happen. Like, it just doesn't happen. And this was before the English were the English. So forget the Americans and the Canadians and the Argentinians, forget all of that. This is before the English were even the English. This is, t the French were the French. The, the, and that was never lost on the eight, nine-year-old me. But also the story of those people who left or were forced to leave their homes, the Palestinians, has always been a tragedy for me. And I've been able, in my mind, to reconcile the fact that Israel has won its right to exist through various wars, but that I don't see why that is um, a zero-sum game for the Palestinians and Palestinian statehood. So I've, I've always been fervent in my support for the two peoples to coexist. And and I come at this from, from that perspective. Israel is a country I've been to. I didn't go to Jerusalem. Um, and I had a thoroughly amazing time there. But I do believe in a two-state solution. And I think that the only real way that the Israeli people will have true peace and security is when there is a just, um, a, an equitable peace with the peoples of the West Bank. We can call them Judea and Samaria we, and with the people of Gaza. And I, I think that also what you alluded to is instructive in part about uh, how the Allies dealt with Japan and Germany after the Second World War. That there was a complete, if we put Japan slightly to one side, that's slightly complicated because Hirohito is kept in power, if not symbolically, to have a, a link of conti political continuity. But put Japan slightly to one side. Mm. But the comprehensive defeat of Nazism in Germany was military, economic and, and, and ideology. And that is what has, has not happened with, with the Palestinian people. And defeating Hamas uh, root and branch doesn't defeat the, the will of Palestinians to have a viable state. And Hamas should be defeated. So don't misconstrue what, what, what I'm saying here at all. Um, but then what the Allies did was and, and, and this is fascinating when, when, when we look at the denazification of Germany, that the British, the Germans and the French go into denazification and the, and the Russians, very obviously. And then the British very quickly realize that if you purge everybody who was at least a card carrier Nazi, that the state doesn't work. There's nobody in the post office. So there is a level of then re-education an acceptance of people who were at least were paper carrying Nazis and an un understanding that they needed to join the Nazi party just to do business. They weren't necessarily ideological Nazis as well as unprecedented economic aid. So we need to um, address the political aspirations of the people who are militarily defeated, flattened. We need uh, to be co um, concerted with that economic aid, etc. And also to create a viable state. And so the, the history of the denazification of Germany is instructive in part, not completely. Uh, but Professor, um, I can talk about history and where uh, it touches geopolitics all day, every day. And I would love to have you back on the show. Um, Professor, tell us um, exactly what you're working on at the moment and possibly where people can find your work online, sir. Well, online, uh, there's lots of uh, YouTubes and uh, articles and so on I've written. Even a few of my books are online, I think pirated editions. Um, but um, as to what I'm doing today, I'm a bit a bit embarrassed to tell you, but I'm actually at the moment 
completing a book on atrocities in the 1948 war. I touched on this subject in my various books, but I decided now to write a book looking at the, both sides' atrocities, um, detailing them and analyzing how and why they happened in 48. So this is the book I'm supposed to complete by February. <laughs> Professor Benny Morris, thank you for coming on to Mid-Atlantic. Uh, you are an eminent Israeli historian, and we were so happy to have your presence on the show. And we'll, we'll get you on again soon uh, to help give us a little bit of a background, at least from an Israeli perspective. But I think you're pre pretty fair, fair and balanced, uh, so we understand exactly why um, Hamas and Israel are in conflict right now by understanding uh, the past. Thank you again, sir. Many thanks for having me. And a pleasure. And, and just before the professor, likewise, sir. And just before the professor, go, professor goes, um, you can send me an email at royfield at gmail .com if you would like to berate me and say I wasn't hard enough on the professor, or maybe I was too hard on him. You can send it to royfield <laughs> at gmail .com. Also, what you can do uh, for the love of all things holy doesn't matter what God you profess uh, to to, uh, to to pray to. Write us a five star review, please, on, on Apple iTunes <laughs> or on Spotify. Uh, that is the best way you can give praise to this podcast because we're all about dialogue. I've held my hand up and I've said I do believe um, in the rights of the Palestinian people to have their own land, a viable state, but that doesn't negate the fact that Israel needs peace and security. And maybe in this conflict, in this terrible conflict, maybe this is the darkest moment before dawn. Maybe. I, I am somewhat who's a bit kumbaya and all, always believes in the inherent goodness uh, of humans and the human spirit. Uh, but I still yet to be proven wrong uh, that sometimes uh, peace and justice, that, that road is incredibly long and it is windy, but the arc of history does bend towards it eventually so on that with that in mind i'd like to bid you all adieu um, how do we say goodbye in in hebrew professor it's like saying hello shalom i thought it I'm was sure, but I'm, I sure didn't you know, I'm sure you know that you know what i did know but i didn't want to <laughs> potentially just make a, a mistake so uh, so it's shalom from the professor and goodbye from me <laughs>